to Mindvine, a mental health podcast for everyone. Since our first episode in 2016, we have been sharing stories of recovery, engaging with experts, and tackling the stigma associated with mental illness. The Mindvine podcast is produced by Ontario Shores Centre for Mental Health Sciences and is available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Welcome to the Mindvine podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Mathers, and today we have, an, as always, a special guest. We have an author of uh, Kicking the Darkness, as well as somebody who is close to Ontario Shores uh, in a number of ways uh, through his advocacy and connections with family and a real advocate for mental health. And I'm pleased to join uh, Shane Christensen. Welcome, Shane. Thank you, dear. It's great to have you here. You've been in, involved in the hospital for a number of years. We've worked on a, a, on a few different uh, projects, uh, advocacy, and today we're just going to talk about your story, uh, which I've found uh, to be very interesting over the years, a lot of different layers. And uh, maybe we'll just start by, you know, I mentioned that you're, uh, you're an author, Kicking the Darkness, but maybe tell people who may not know what your connection to mental health uh, is. My connection actually started when I was uh, 11 years old and my older brother, who was 13 at the time, he went from being a happy, carefree uh, child and then when he hit his teens, there was a drastic and sudden change. And uh, he became very introverted to the point where he didn't even want to leave his room. And at that point in time, we're talking 1973, there was tremendous stigma regarding any type of mental illness. So one thing I identified right away, e even as a child myself, was that you were supposed to whisper whenever we were talking about my brother. Uh, my parents didn't want us discussing what he was going uh, through at school or with friends. It reminded me like a, a dirty secret that we weren't supposed to ever talk about. And that was painful because I, I really loved my brother. Uh, because he was my older brother, it, you, there's a, a sense of worship sometimes because he taught me so many things as a young child in my formative years, and then to experience what he was going through and to see such a, a drastic change and a decline, not only in his mental health, but you could see it physically, uh, that he, he just changed so drastically that uh, it was very painful for all of us. And that with the stigma in the 1970s and just the societal view towards mental illness, he was never diagnosed. I don't think my parents ever took him to the doctor or you know, got him any type of medical treatment at all. And that was something that I never forgot. And it was something that uh, I, I didn't agree with, but I was powerless to do anything about. I know there were family discussions at times where both myself and my younger brother, we would ask my parents, what are we gonna do about Eric? Like there's something wrong. And they were dealing with so many issues themselves that they were powerless to, to affect any real positive change. And my brother ended up uh, living 18 more years, and, uh, but it, his quality of life w was never good at all. He, he struggled throughout his entire life and then at 31 years of age, he ended up committing suicide. And at that time, uh, you go through so much as a, uh, a loved one of someone who's ended their life. There's a lot of guilt. You feel like you should have done more. You, you could have done more. And that caused me to go through many issues myself that I struggled with just trying to deal with uh, all of the emotion and absorb that. And I finally got to a place where, uh, luckily for me, I turned to exercise. A and I went into it, I, I was basically training like a, what a professional athlete would train, and that worked for me. It, it, I found that mentally, emotionally, physically, they were all tied in together, and that allowed me to overcome all of the, the weight and baggage that I was carrying from my childhood and my brother's situation. Just to, just to back up a bit on that, because there's, there's a lot more to your story sure. uh, to come. But 
you know, when you talk about your brother and going through that at the time and even the way your parents approached it, it uh, in 2022, it's hard for people to understand, especially parents, because, you know, a, a child has a mystery symptom of something now. Um, you know, we have the Internet. We have uh, a network of people. There's uh, while there's still stigma in our world, um, there are areas that are, you know, have less shame. We're more open to ask for guidance, uh, connect with other parents. But, you know, I can understand why in the 70s that maybe that wasn't the case, but like maybe not everybody can. So maybe you can take us through that era, like, um, you know, about how mental illness, you know, was or was not addressed in that time and, and maybe the societal pressures that, you know, your parents and others would have faced, you know, having somebody that was quote unquote like different back then. Exactly. And it's, it's remarkable when I look back the change uh, that a generation makes. And anyone who lived in the 1960s or 1970s, the one thing that stands out is, and I really see this now at my age, it was a very tough, mean type of culture where anyone that was different was mocked, they were denigrated, um, they were shamed in a lot of different ways and definitely with mental illness. One thing that was really hard on me was even within my circle of friends, um, because of that culture, there was a lack of sensitivity. They would make statements that were hurtful to me. And I grew up with a very tight group of friends. And there were times where we were estranged simply because they offended my brother, which offended me. Uh, many hurtful things were said. There was a lot of gossip and just your, your classic stigma, uh, the, the traits of stigma that exist where uh, it's so hurtful that it causes divisions with, between friends, between family members. And that was the case in the 1970s. It was just, there was no sympathy at all. I think it was reflected uh, even in movies that at the time, I can remember seeing a movie, I think it was called The End, with Burt Reynolds. And there were certain scenes that back then you would laugh at without even thinking about them, where today it would be a totally different reaction because of the lack of sensitivity and the fact that we typically don't poke fun at a person who has a heart attack or who's suffering through a serious illness like cancer. But in the 1970s, that may happen or it, it definitely would happen with mental illness and i don't know why it was but that was definitely around at that time and even back then like having grown up in the in the 80s like my formative years uh suicide and mental illness weren't linked at least not societal right not always anyways it was um you know suicide was just considered uh, an act uh, in a lot of cases and uh, and I recall um, you know some mysterious deaths as a child uh, that I later found out you know um, were in fact you know suicide and um, back then I'm guessing you know the same the same situation uh, would have occurred and like um, when you think back to that time like your experience but also maybe what your parents were going through like um, really uh, sounds like a really difficult period to be different, like you said, and be um, you know a, a loved one of somebody who's going through that. Yeah, because you your loved one is shunned for the most part, and that's societal. It's not just you know your friends. It's because of the prevalent view of society that, especially with suicide, it was not only you wouldn't say it was frowned upon. It was looked at with complete disgust that many people felt based upon their upbringing that if you even contemplated suicide, as you mentioned, they never looked at it as that being a product of a serious illness, a mental illness. They thought that you were somehow weak or that you yeah, were- Taking the easy way out or something like that. Taking the easy like, way out. So, things that sound so ridiculous today. And a lot, many times in my brother's case it was discounted so friends family would make a remark that i i heard many times that you know he, he's not going to hurt himself they most people would not believe that anyone would actually commit suicide but then after it happened it was almost like oh i didn't think that would happen and then there was remorse uh, 
there was sympathy, there were all of the, the support that wasn't there before, all of a sudden bubbled to the surface because it, it was an acknowledgement that this person did have a serious illness. They weren't faking it. You know, I would hear things like, oh, your brother's lazy. He just doesn't want to go to school. He doesn't want to work. And I knew that wasn't true uh, because we were, you know, so we lived together. You had that intimate relationship. And I knew that uh, struggling isn't the appropriate term. He, he was going through a crisis that was debilitating where it, he could no longer live a life that he would have lived without that mental illness. And that's what I knew. And that's what was so difficult for me and my family to live through that and to experience that. You, know, you mentioned that he was kind of going through this around, you know, his early teens uh, and you were, you know, younger and no diagnosis, kind of like as a family, probably white knuckling it. Um, when did you come to the realization that he was ill or you started to piece things together or like was it later or when you look back at his life and you're you, you know a little bit more about mental illness that you were able to piece things together like how did you you know piece everything together i knew even then that he was seriously ill i didn't understand it uh, but there were multiple suicide attempts and uh, one of the most profound was uh, when he had downed a, a bottle of Tylenol and I was woken up by my mom and this would have been in 1973. And at the time when the first responders showed up, I remember the look on their faces when you know they were taking my brother to the ambulance and just the way they were looking at him and then looking at my mom and looking at me. And it was almost like they were trying to figure out what would ever compel a 13-year-old child to, to do something like that? I'm 11 years old, so I don't think of my brother as being a child. I look at him as being older than me, wiser, more life experience. But then now in hindsight, when I think back to it, and when I had kids and then they're, they're 10, 11, 12 years old, that was one of those moments where you really start to reflect and, and you're starting to figure out, you know, asking questions, why did certain things happen? How could they happen at that time? And then when my grandson was born, there's a whole new point of reflection. Uh, and it, it could be age, as we get older, we tend to get more reflective. And then in my case, and I'll expand on this later, I had a, a near-death uh, health crisis. So that really caused a lot of reflection where I would look back at my brother's situation and at different times of my life. And you're really trying to figure them out. And you, you don't always know why. Maybe it's to reconcile a lot of things and you're, you're, you're trying to come to a conclusion and make peace, peace with yourself on why certain things happen. Use you, I kind of transition, I guess, you know, the, I know that experience with your brother and, um, and I imagine a very influential part of your life. And then, you know, you mentioned having kids and eventually grandkids, but, you know, raising a family uh, is where kind of the next chapter of your mental health journey kind of yes. enters the picture. But, um, you know, maybe before we get to like your son's experience, did your experience growing up with your brother, did that put you on like maybe high alert uh, as you transitioned into like, you know, parenthood uh, in terms of watching your children or how, like how did that kind of shape uh, who you were as an adult or did it take like an experience to kind of um, get you to that place? Yeah, and, and with my brothers, one thing I haven't talked about that I'll go into a, a little bit because it, it kind of ties into the whole societal culture of the 1960s and 70s. Um, I harbored a, a lot of frustration. Uh, there was a lot of complexity regarding why my brother got ill. And there was a lot of family dysfunction uh, within our nuclear family. So there was my mother and father, and then three sons. They, we were two years apart. And we, we had a, an idyllic life during the daytime. But then in the evening, uh, my parents drank to the point they, they were definitely alcoholics. And alcoholism, like any type of addiction, can get progressively worse if left unchecked. 
and that's what happened with their situation. So it went from being, you know, I can remember five, six, seven years old, where uh, if they were drinking, having parties, it was actually fun. It was exciting. You got to watch grown-ups acting silly. But then as it got worse, physical violence entered the household. And uh, ironically enough, many times it was my mother who was violent towards my father. And uh, I don't remember my dad ever hitting my mom. Uh, there'd be a lot of violence where she was hitting him and he would defend himself. But it was still, it was a horror show, uh, for lack of a better term. And that's something you never forget. Uh, I'll watch the occasional war movie. And when, as I'm watching it, I can relate to what the soldiers are going through. And because I've gone through that as a young child, when you see your parents in situations where they're, they're literally trying to kill themselves, that has a consequence. So I knew even as a young child that when my brother first fell ill, I thought this is because of our childhood. It's because of what we witnessed, what we were subjected to. And again, you didn't talk about that at all. And that's a whole different story that is beyond stigma. It's just, I can remember being in elementary school and teachers knowing that something was wrong, something was definitely amiss, but they were very limited on what they would say and what they would do. And I would hope in 2022, things are different, that if, whether it's teachers or society notices that there's uh, something seriously wrong within a household, that there would be more support and help for children because in the 1960s, and it wasn't just my family, I know from my life experience, talking to many different people, they went through the same thing. It, it was a cultural situation at that time where there was a lot of drinking, a lot of partying, and there were you know, consequences for young children. And, Definitely in my brother's case. And you don't find out until decades later that other people have kind of gone through this similar experience, right? Um, you know, when you talk about connecting with friends and it turns out you're, you know, that they were going through something similar, but unfortunately in, back then, or at least probably still today, it takes time for people to get comfortable to share that, which is actually one of the more comforting things when you're, you are exactly know, experience that. Uh, so as you, um, become an adult and and your your family situation um where did the mental health piece kind of re-enter the equation so after my brother's suicide in 1991 and then by this time our kids were getting a bit older and uh when we ended up having three children my daughter candace as you know and then two boys and then when my middle son just before he uh, was 16 years of age, we started seeing certain uh, changes that I was sensitive to because of my brother's situation. It was almost like a deja vu moment. And the one thing with both my wife and myself is uh, was that immediately, at the first hint of any issues, we were going to be different than my parents because I always looked at things. I, I tried to basically summarize them where my brother was ill. He didn't get any support or medical treatment at all. And it ended up in him committing suicide. That was not going to happen with my son. We were going to go 180 degrees differently. And when his symptoms were getting worse and more profound, we went into it, both my wife and myself, with the attitude, we will do everything we have to do to get him help. And then the biggest surprise and letdown for me is I naively thought it would be a simple case of we'll go to the hospital, we'll go to the doctor, and then we're going to get him help. And I found out it's not as easy as that. You literally encounter a, a systemic wall of resistance that it's true with every illness that if the person who is going through the illness isn't actively participating uh, in their recovery or to even get help, the initial uh, medical assessment, it's difficult to do that. But I know from personal life experience with my heart attack and then when I look at my son and my brother, when there's a mental illness, many times 
the person lacks the insight or they're simply in denial out of fear, there can be any number of reasons where they do not want to admit, I have a mental illness. And no one can blame them. Like you look at my brother's experience with the stigma and the shame, um, I didn't experience that you know, to the degree that my son or brother did when I had my uh, heart attack and the recovery uh, process with that. And um, so when I, when I compare all three of them with mental illness, it's just totally different the way the person who is going through that is treated uh, in every aspect. And I believe your son is diagnosed with schizophrenia. He was, yes. And um, that in and of itself has another layer of stigma. Absolutely. Uh, in the in the kind of the mental illness uh, realm, and I would imagine you know, and I don't want to make light of any mental illness, but there are certain ones, um, thanks to inititives like Bell Let's Talk and just the way society has evolved, that have become more accepted. You know, like that people are more open to sh sharing the fact that they may be on antidepressants or they may uh, suffer from anxiety. Definitely. Those, you know, those have become, uh, you know, a little bit more of societal norms. Schizophrenia is is not there, yeah. um, and and especially when your son's going through it, um, I want to know what you learned about, you know, actually caring for a loved one who has schizophrenia, but also like um, caring for somebody who has that label with schizophrenia because it's probably one of the most uh, misunderstood illnesses. Um, you know, people equate it often to um, split personalities and other things that they've seen in movies and TV, TV shows. So from your experience, when you hear the words like schizophrenia with your son um, at those early stages, like what was, what was that like for you? At that time, as much as I didn't want, you never want your children to have any illness. I was so determined to avoid my brother's situation that in many respects, I had blinders on. I was just driven to try to get him the help that I thought would make him better, for lack of a better term. And a lot of that was based, even with my brother's experience, I didn't know a lot about mental illness, uh, even though I had lived it for all the years with my brother. And then in my son's case, right from the initial onset, uh, when he had, uh, you know, the first couple of years, they would just diagnose it as a psychotic break or uh, early onset psychosis. But uh, I was reading a lot about psychosis. And then I knew from what I read that it, it appeared that uh, he would eventually be diagnosed with having schizophrenia. And I, I read about that. And I'll, I'll never forget one particular day when there was one part of me that was so determined and so positive and I was reading documentation and uh, it had said that a person with schizophrenia was 10 or 20 times more likely to commit suicide. And even talking about it now, I get emotional because it felt like someone just stabbed me. And it, it was a flashback to my brother and I remember saying to my wife, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can go through this. And I have a very loving, supportive wife and, and we had a great conversation and I did get through it. But just that initial realization that this is a serious illness. And as you said, it's much maligned, it's misunderstood. And part of that creates an environment where a person who is experiencing schizophrenia has a fear of going for help, a fear of acknowledging that go they're going through an illness. And all that does is create greater misery that can end up catastrophically, like in my brother's case. And um, so in answer to your question, once I realized that my son did have schizophrenia initially. It was just absolute horror. It, it was devastating. And then I moved on from that. Um, and, and a large part of my ability to absorb that was because I was working out all the time, which I can't stress how beneficial that was. 
that it's natural. I, I think of the soldiers that I referred to earlier coming back from World War I or World War II, and they dealt with all of their experiences by numbing the pain, whether it was alcohol or what have you. And I, I, I'm a firm believer in you have to do whatever it takes that gets you through, that allows you to overcome a tremendous life experience or challenge. And if having a couple of drinks does it, or, or whatever you have to do to absorb that, I'm all for that. In my case, because of my family history, I was really afraid. I, I thought I can't deviate towards any type of synthetic substances, can't be alcohol or anything else. So I got right into working out and that empowered me. And it, in hindsight, if I hadn't have done that, uh, I don't know if I would have gone through it simply because of what I had already experienced with my brother and then having to go through it with my son. Because the other consideration with an illness such as schizophrenia, it, it's not for weeks or months. It can literally last years. And in my son's case, he, he never realized a true stability for until about 15 years. So that's 15 years of struggle. And some of the things that the general public may not be aware of is that your quality of life as a parent, anytime your child is faced with an illness of any kind, your quality of life is almost non-existent because you live and die as your, your kids do. So for many years, there was no joy. Uh, simple things like, you know, it sounds mundane, but being able to travel, even to go to Niagara Falls for a day, you couldn't do stuff like that. Your life literally revolved around, in our case, our son. And it was, you know, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You were concentrating on your son, on your child to get them better. And that's very difficult. As a caregiver, uh, you can get burned out. And that was another reason why I was committed to working out all the time. My wife worked out, we did a lot of things, even things like walking, just to get us out into the fresh air. But you were very limited on what you could do to, to get a break from what you were going through. And that's difficult as a caregiver. And the caregiver piece is, is interesting because we're seeing a, a movement now, or at least a recognition that um, you can't help your child, child that's unwell if you're unwell. Absolutely. And, uh, I know we've, we, we, do, we do work uh, at Ontario Shores with our Family Resource Centre and offer support to uh, the family members uh, of loved ones who are receiving care. Um, so obviously, you know, you found, you found your niche. And um, is that something that, I mean, you kind of, you've already stated kind of its importance, but, you know, somebody that's going through this with a loved one now, um, like what would you tell them, right? Like a priority one in terms of, how they, uh, they treat themselves during this process. Information is always a key as far as I'm concerned. From the time, uh, even going back to my brother and information wasn't as accessible, but in the internet age we live in, uh, the information age we live in now, you can get so much information. There's a lot of great, uh, great resources on the Ontario Shores website. I'm affiliated with the Ontario Caregivers Organization, which has great information on their website. And it doesn't solve all of your problems, but one of the frustrations that I went through with my son, you know, in 2003, 2004, was not knowing. You, you just didn't know where to turn. You didn't know what support was out there, where in 2022, you don't even have to get up from your computer and you can readily find that information within a couple of minutes. And, and it can help guide you to, you know, some of the key things that I discuss uh, in many of uh, the events I do is the fact that as a caregiver, you have to have support yourself, that you can't do it all, especially in cases of serious mental illness because it's so daunting. And that if you don't look after yourself, as you said, you, you can't be any help to your child. So things like that, just finding out that you're not alone, that 
There are many parents who are experiencing this, not only for mental illness, but for any type of illness where you literally feel like your life has become derailed because you're so consumed in providing that support to your loved one. And then through shared experiences and through the sharing of information, uh, you almost have an epiphany where you understand you're not alone. There are many groups and organizations that you can attend, you can get support yourself, which is really important. We're talking about recovery you know, for mental illness, especially from a parent perspective. Um, when your son's born, any of your children are born, you know, you, you have hopes and dreams for them, just like they eventually do when they're growing up and, um, you know, a life kind of adjusts those those hopes and dreams as you as you live through them. When you're going through, uh, when you have a complex mental illness like your son does, um, sometimes um, recovery looks different. Um, their life is going to look different than maybe what they had expected or what you had uh, expected. And um, I think we look at the healthcare system now because, and I'm talking about the broader healthcare system because the advance of modern technology, we see people who are quite ill and um, being able to, whether it's have a procedure done or a medication or some type of, of therapy, and they can almost go back to living you know, their, their life. And that does happen with people with mental illness, but um, oftentimes um, they have to change their life and their expectations. and. Um, you know, we see people here who, uh, we have people who are patients here who are, uh, you know, lawyers, doctors, teachers, um, who can't go back to their jobs because it doesn't align uh, with what they have to do to manage their illness. So when you're talking about what, your, what recovery looks like for your son, you know, what has he been able to achieve and how have you had to maybe, like, change what your expectations or his expectations were for his life? Like, how has that whole process kind of evolved? It's a, a very valid point because as you say, as a parent, you have great dreams for your, your kids. And when they're faced with any type of uh, challenge, uh, whether it be mental illness or a physical disease or what have you, there's that moment as a parent where you contemplate, you know, does this mean that they may never do this or do that? And it's, it's heartbreaking as a parent. You, you suffer a loss because all of the hopes and dreams that you had for your child are, are no longer there. And that's what you feel initially. And then in my case and my wife's case, there's a bit of a pivot that occurs because you start to look at things totally different. And I've always gravitated towards positive thinking and that's because of my life experience. I, I've learned that in order to overcome tremendous adversity, you don't want to dwell on negativity. Uh, many times it can be a waste of energy and uh, I've always tried to concentrate on the positive aspect. And when my son first realized a stability, he was able to finish high school. He was able to get a driver's license. He was able to, and I'll even take it back a bit, he could do small things like watch a TV show and laugh. And during the darkest days of his illness, that wasn't possible. He could not concentrate on anything uh, for more than a few seconds uh, because it was such a, an extreme illness that he was going through. We had medication compliance issues. And, and because he wasn't actively working uh, towards getting better, it, it made it that much more difficult. And in his case, the illness got progressively worse. So going from a situation like that, that was so catastrophic to where he attained a stability, where he was able, as I say, you know, small things that many parents probably wouldn't think were a big accomplishment. Oh, well, everyone should get a grade 12 or get their license. With us, there was absolute joy and just we were so proud of him. And he has worked periodically and moments like that where you're, you're proud. And uh, the most, one of the most special moments for me was seeing the change in him when my grandson was born, 
and uh, there were many times because of his illness that my son never showed uh, what I would call sincere joy. And now that he's ex had the experience of being an uncle and he, he loves his uh, nephew so much and there's moments where we would be together and I would see the way that my son was looking at my grandson and inside you're, you're so content, you're so happy that life has given you that because there were times where I thought that I would never see that. Uh, that. Something as simple as seeing my son smile in a way that uh, was based upon joy and just a uh, quality of life that he was experiencing. And I see that now. So that's priceless to me. And, you know, he may never accomplish things that 20 years ago I thought he might, but what he's doing with his life now gives me great joy and pride. And I, I know that his life will be much better than what I thought it would be during the dark days. When it, I, there were times where I didn't know if there was gonna be any light at the end of the tunnel, and that's difficult for any parent. I was just gonna ask about that, because um, we often talk about hope, you know, at Ontario Shores and in mental health, the mental health community. Um, but you're talking about like two decades worth of a journey just with your son, not to, not even to mention, you know, your own issues and, and how you managed uh, your own health and, and then uh, dealing with the, the tragedy of your brother. Were there times where you had lost hope or had, were you able to always, like I know you were determined, you know, like, uh, you know, for your son to, to get the help he needed. Um, but I'm guessing you weren't thinking it was gonna take 15 plus years at that Absolutely. point, right? Like, so what was that like, and maybe in those darkest days um, of trying to keep moving forward? You do lose hope. Um, what happened with me is that because of the support of my wife, we were fortunate in that if we kind of platooned in our relationship so that when I was down and I was losing hope, my wife would always be my greatest cheerleader. And it would be shoulder rub time saying, hang in there, you know, it's going to be okay. Very much like a boxing match that instead of going 12 rounds, it goes 15 years. Mm -hmm. And you have to adapt and you have to, in order to survive that and to have a successful outcome, you have to rely on each other because there are times, I can remember being at the gym one time and I loved exercising. It always gave me a feeling of bliss and I would use that to dampen the negative feelings that I was going through, where you felt depressed, you felt sad because of what you were experiencing. And on this one particular day, as I was working out, I kind of looked up in the mirror and I thought internally within myself, why are you even doing this? What's, what's the point? Like there's, there's no hope. And, but, but I got through that. And then, and then through life experience, you realize having those feelings it's a human feeling and anyone who's faced with great adversity is going to lose hope but i have the fortunate uh, hindsight that i've seen that life can change very quickly and you can go from the darkest moments where you you're hopeless and then you're experiencing something like my son having sincere joy and just thinking, wow, I would not have seen that coming. And then when it does, it truly makes it more special. And one of the greatest examples I can give, we haven't touched upon my health uh, challenge, but I had a massive heart attack in 2017, and I was sure I was going to die. And based upon the fact that I was very athletic for my adult life, I studied kinesiologist, I, kinesiology, I really knew my body intuitively. And when I was in the hospital uh, for three days, everything that I was witnessing, whether it was the, the monitor, what the, do the cardiologist was telling me, I came to the conclusion that, okay, th this is it. You know, I I'm gonna die. And I, I made peace with that. 
uh, but it's it's a process. It's difficult. You you go through. It's almost similar to when you hear someone else is dying and you get sad. That's what I was like when I was in the hospital for three days, where you're thinking, "Wow, this really is terrible." You're you go from the the world of the living, uh, and you're not in the world of the dead yet. But you're in between in this gray area where, even though physically you're existing, you're not really living. Because at that time, I knew that you know I couldn't even leave the hospital because it. I had a piece of plaque in me that they were very worried about, and if that plaque moved, uh, there was a likelihood that I could have died, could have had a massive stroke or an even worse heart attack. And I remember one time asking just to walk 10 feet to go to the bathroom, and the nurse is like, "You can't do that. We literally want to keep you here." and you're in this state of just where you don't do anything. And then when I recovered from that, I went through a process where I had angioplasty, a stent put in. It was a long recovery process, but I finally got to the point where you feel that you've returned to the land of the living or the world of the living. And you appreciate things even more, similar to my son, and when I see him smiling and having joy, I appreciate that more because I don't take it for granted. And not to say that every parent would, uh, but in my case, I can remember returning to work one time and going down to the uh, work by Lake Ontario. It was a beautiful day, the sun is shining, and I had rolled the windows down momentarily just to, to do my notes. And there was this gust of wind that just hit me in the face. And I remember breathing, and there was this sense of total joy, and just like, wow, I'm alive. And I thought, if I could bottle that and give that to all the people that are struggling and faced with any type of challenge, it would just be priceless. And yet all it was was an acknowledgement that life is special. And when you're, you've recovered from a serious illness of any kind and you're able to appreciate the, even the small joys of life, it is so special. And that's lost on many people. Uh, I see it every day, you know, we're, we're all challenged and we're living in a, at a time where there's great challenge and struggle. And sometimes we don't stop and smell the roses. And I've been in that place where I really thought I was going to die, and when you've recovered, it's really hard to express how profoundly beautiful it is just to be able to breathe and to live and to experience joy. You do a lot of work uh, now with advocacy and telling your story. Uh, your daughter, Candace, who you've referenced a, a few times, um, was an ambassador of hope for our 100th yes. anniversary a, a few years ago and has you know, shared her experience you know, supporting your son, her brother, uh, through his uh, recovery journey. Um, when you talk to people, um, at, whether it's at events like you've done here or uh, in other work, what are some of the things that people come up to you and ask or say? What are some of those interactions like? Many times I can tell when I'm speaking and I look out into an audience and you can tell the people who, who have been affected and they have a certain look and it's almost like a kindred spirit because you've touched something in them that, and also getting back to what I had said earlier when people realize I'm not alone and they'll look at me and think, he's going through something that I'm going through now. And yet he's talking about remaining positive and in, that he's got to a point where his son is doing okay. But in, in my experience, it's different in that I've also experienced tragedy. And I get asked a lot of times, how can you maintain hope when your brother's story didn't end well? And, and my answer to that is, not all cases are going to end well. That's a reality. It's a difficult reality, but it doesn't mean that, you know, I personally, I, I don't give up hope. And you, you keep pushing because uh, 
for every case that may not end the way we want it to. There may be 10 people that do, and, and a lot of times it's based upon what they hear and they see uh, through uh, a person such as myself who has a life experience that they can relate to. And uh, that helps them to overcome some of the obstacles. Many family members who are struggling, looking to get help for their loved ones, they sometimes feel that I can offer them guidance that is more than what I can in, in actuality. I can steer them in the right direction as far as making positive choices to remain strong, but I can't diagnose, I can't, you know, if I had a magic wand where I could solve everyone's problem, I would do that, but what worked for me and my family may not work for a hundred other people. It's, in many respects, it's so specific to the individual. And probably the number one thing I hear is, why do you do it? How can you get up and talk about that? And the, the main point is, it's difficult. I never wanted to be in this position. Uh, I would have chosen a much different life uh, than what I've lived. And I wish I never had to be a mental health ad advocate, but uh, one of the experiences I had in my three days of being in the hospital where I was sure I was gonna die was a feeling of shame and guilt because I felt that I owed it to my brother more than anyone else that I had to tell a story because um, he had gone through so much. And um, I, I wanted him to know that uh, I loved him and everything I do is for him and, and I'll never stop. But uh, it's, it's not an easy process, it's difficult, but I'm committed to doing it in the memory of my brother. I do it because of what my family has experienced with my son and the fact that I want to stress positivity because I know there's many people out there that are struggling and maybe they're having the experience I had at the gym where they're thinking, why am I even bothering? And I would just say, hang in there because you, you don't know. One day you could experience joy that is beyond belief and I'm living proof that that can happen. Well, thank you very much, Shane, for telling your story and for being here. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've heard different versions of it. Uh, we've talked over the years, but to sit down and, and kind of hear it from start to finish is really uh, powerful and inspiring. And thanks for the work you do here and as well as in the community and uh, for being so honest. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Daryl. Make sure to like and subscribe and turn on post notifications. Thank you for watching Mind Vine Podcast.